Joining us now, former defensive end, uh, Super Bowl champion, NFL star, uh, first round draft pick, uh, the host of the Greenlight podcast, where you can listen to anywhere you get your podcast. This guy stays dehydrated. It's Chris Long, everybody. <laughs> how you doing? What up, brother? What's this up, is man? cool. It's it's nice to finally meet you on Zoom, which is how we meet nowadays. It is, this is the new way to meet people uh, from a safe technical distance. It's peoplemeet.com. Peoplemeet.com. Yeah, man. I'm super excited at, to look. What I'm most excited about is to talk about your father. So I'm old, yeah, and that's good. <laughs> What's good is like what I like is like fucking you starting the interview and just like laying it out there. But a lot of people are like. Chris, what are your interests? And then two minutes in, they're like, so what's it like growing up with a dad with a flat but top? What, what's TV? fucking, what, the funny thing is like, I, you know, as a kid, I'm like a lot of kids, right? Where to me, you know, sports was everything, but I was for like, by far, it was just football. Like I didn't like, you know, some kids are like, now it's baseball season. I love baseball. Yeah. No, <laughs> like it was football, then basketball, but still football was like, you know, the, that's the main event. That's the wife. Oh yeah. And then your dad, I mean, I had, I had posters in my fucking room. So my dad was your first wife. You're, I hate to say this, but when I learned about masturbation is when I discovered your father. <laughs> so it's, uh, well, when I learned about it, I was pretty fucking nervous. Your first wife was going to walk out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a, it was, um, oh man. And here's the thing. I, I almost, you know what? I'm just going to say it. He's still very handsome. I was looking at a photo of him earlier. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jesus Christ, what kind of fucking genetics are you coming from? The guy's 61? The, I, he's, dude, he's 61. He, of course, he feels 78 on the inside. Sure. He just got his shoulder replaced. Shout out to dad. And by the way, like, you know, if you were a fan of his growing up, you should know he's legitimately that kind of guy in person, like a real good dude. Yeah. And as humble and cool as a guy you'd meet, but like also one of my best friends. So great dude. Um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't know where we were. I don't know. Um, but I don't, I don't know where my brain, is. my brain just, you know what the problem is? And you'll actually laugh at this is, or you won't laugh, but uh, it's a story nonetheless, uh, is we did our pod today. And then on the tail end, we had Jeff Garland for a few. Uh -huh. You probably know. I Jeff, know Jeff. And, yeah. and it's like going from him to you. It's a lot of smart, funny people like that I have to encounter in a row. And that's intimidating. It's intimidating interviewing comedians and then being interviewed by comedians. It is. Cause you always I feel like I think what people a lot, a lot of times when I do interviews, sometimes afterwards they'll be like, "I thought you were gonna fuck with me the whole time," and I'm like, "Yeah, no, I didn't. I don't know, man. I'm normal. I didn't. Yeah, I'm I was, normal. I was. Or or they'll be like, they're kind of like this, and then they're like, they have this face of like, I don't know, like apprehension or something, and I'm like, what's going on? They're like, I don't know. I'm just waiting for you to say something that will uh, upset people. I, I or feel something. like people try to get on like if I have a comedian on and I'm like afraid to interview Jeff Garland because I'm intimidated by it. Like you don't want to. You don't want to try to be too funny. You're like, you're oh, like right. I want to be normal funny, but you don't want to like try to impress the comedian and be funny. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think what you're getting to, though, is probably this is like a universal thing that we're all just in our heads too much about whoever we're, you know, you always have like a thought, well, you know, this person's really good looking, so I'll, I, I got to be careful about this. <laughs> so this I got to person, try to be sexy. Yeah, I got to try to be sexy or this guy is a great <laughs> athlete, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some push-ups today and bring him up. I'm going to juggle know? a fucking ball or something. Yeah, and it's like we're right all just... I came on and you were just like, hey, man, hey, man sorry, I, I do juggling. sports too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's tough. Why the Texas shirt? Are you a Texas fan or... Is you uh, I just shirt? moved there. I just moved to Texas. So. Oh, where are you? Uh, well, I'm currently in Los Angeles, but I, I bought a house in Austin and I... I uh, of course. Yeah. I live there. I, I say no more. I live there now, I guess. Yeah. You were asking me about my dad. You asked me something about my dad and I got sidetracked. Well, I, I, about, I was like your genetics. I was like looking at the guy and I'm like, what oh, is he just drinking God. baby blood before he goes? To I bed? hate it. You know what? I, it might be baby blood. You know what I hate is we'll take pictures and I want to post them, but I'll be like, man, I look old as fuck. Yeah. And this guy, I mean, it, dude, I have, when my dad was 61, if you put him next to your dad, you would be like, so is this your great grandfather? Like, did he it, live inside a coal mine? I mean, like, why does he look like, I, mean, I don't know. This is just life, I guess, man. I don't know. The guy looks 90 and he's 61, but your dad looks 44. It's he, insane. My dad has one little blemish on his entire body. It's a little scar on his head that you can barely see. When he was a kid, he got in a car accident and went through the windshield. Like, that's it. Like, wow. I think God was just like, you're not going to be, Lawrence Taylor and Brad Pitt combined. Right, you right. You like got, I gotta yeah, fucking, I gotta, crazy. I gotta scuff you up a little bit. And yeah, it sucks. So you take a picture of him. my brother just got married. Congrats, to Kyle and Kate. Out Congrats, Kyle. 
and great pictures. But when you come away from it, you're like, I think that was a good picture of me. And then I scanned to the right. My, my dad looks like my little brother. So it, it can suck. It can suck. Now, did you, how early do you know? Cause like, again, when you're a kid and you just love this sport and you, and these are your heroes, right? They're literally posters on your wall. But then like the guy that has posters on the wall is your dad. Like, do you, cause do you, were you also obsessed with foot, like as a little kid, are you watching? I, I, he he kind of did the opposite to me. It was interesting. Cause like I had like Bo Jackson in the kitchen. Sure. Like just having oh, just a chilling. to eat with my dad, like yeah. just hanging out. You know, like, and I can remember it faintly, but I don't remember the significance in my head because my parents did a really good job of being like your normal dude. Like, yeah, your dad's normal. His job is just football. Yeah. Doesn't make you special. And I tried to do the same thing with my son. And it also kind of instructed like waiting to have kids later in my career. So there's no chance that he thinks he's hot shit because his dad or that he looks at me as like, you know, some larger than life figure. I'm his dad. Right. And my dad did a really good job. You know, all things considered, he's a real life superhero. Yeah of not like just making that who he was when he came home. He's a superhero, but in a different way to me. Yes. And so, you know, I think that's the key, but I met, I can remember Barry Sanders, you know, is my favorite running back of all time. Yeah. No disrespect to sweetness, but, uh, I was like, man, it'd be cool to meet Barry Sanders. And my dad was like, you met him like four times when you were a kid at the pro bowl. Like you just don't remember he yeah. handed you a Jersey, you know? And that was, it was so normalized to me. And I'm not bragging. What I'm saying is it's just different. It's more normal. People are like, what's that like? It's normal. Then when you play sports comes the pressure yeah. of dealing with that, which is yes. different. De totally different. By the way, I met Barry Sanders at an ATM machine and I didn't think that that was uh, too much. And I think afterwards I was like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I was like, hey man. He was like, yeah, <laughs> he's getting money out of this thing. I'm like, you're fucking Barry Sanders. Uh, can I take a picture? And he's like, uh, okay. <laughs> can I take a picture of your pen? Yeah, like, man. You know, like how the, much are you getting out, bro? Okay, that might be the worst place to meet a fan, ATM. Yeah. But actually, the worst place is a urinal. But, yeah, always. And like, as you, and you're like, I literally am holding my dick right now. And they're like, <laughs> holding my penis, yeah. man. And they're like, dude, you I'm know? a big fan. You're like, cool. I've, I even had a guy at a urinal once reach his hand over, like to shake hands <laughs> over the thing. And I was like, let's, come on, man. Like, let's wash up first. He's like, oh, all right. All right, man. I'm like, oh, uh, dude, I'm trying to get to the mint guy. Like, yeah, just give me a second. Take a break. Yeah. Yeah. But Let's the, put our dicks away and then we'll The meet. ATM is bold too. It is. I did that to but, him and Pharaoh Munch. I did it to both of them. Oh, Pharaoh yes. bold. I did it to him. I was like, Pharaoh Munch. And he was like, yeah. <laughs> I turned around. I was like, what's up? And he's like, I'm getting money out of the ATM. <laughs> what have you been up to? Yeah, man. What's up? What's up? What are, you, what are your codes at? Um, so wait, when you just, when you are, a kid though and i i really like they make you normal stuff but when you start playing football yeah are you is your dad like coaching you up you know like dad no do, he, or? he's not like the dude in little giants or something you no. know like he's my dad was almost he had the opposite like he was a coach but he coached me in practice like he'd come to practice and then game day he would stand off in the corner mm -hmm. which is again a very intentional like hey it's your show man yeah and that meant a lot to me. Like, you know, I didn't care and I wasn't ashamed of my dad or anything like that because I was proud of him, but it brings undue pressure and it brings like yeah. pressure that ultimately made me a lot tougher, honestly. But in the beginning, you don't see it that way. In the beginning, it's like, fuck, everything I do is it's just because of your dad. Like I'm talking like win an award in high school, win county player of the year. It's nepotism, you know, yeah. get a scholarship. It's ne nepotism. Oh, you know, 13 sacks in the ACC, get picked in the first round, nepotism, sign the first deal, you know, like on down right. the line. And no, you get you no credit. You have to accept, I, you know, you have to accept that there will always be some people that will look at you and say, and you're inextricably li linked to a Hall of Famer, which is unfair, but it's fucking reality. And it's there was also reality. a lot of great things too. Like my dad got to, he taught me a lot, you know? I had a dad who understood my career, who understood bad days and good days. Yeah. He knew what to say after a loss. Like, so it's a give and take. And um, I think ultimately it made me tougher and thicker skin. I think I remember, that's, that's awesome that that's the relationship you have. I even remember, I, uh, I don't remember if it was like an article I read, a couple of things that just like popped into my head. One that I think he had what was celebrated as like the best rip move in the, yeah. in the league. Yeah, I think I remember, yeah. like, right? And he that they're like, his rip move is insane. And then, <laughs> and then also I read some article one time, this is just coming from memory of, of like, um, he mentored somebody, I forget the player and like brought him to live with, with him. Well, right. A couple guys live with him. I know Chester McLaughlin, uh, that might be the one lived with him. Yes. God rest his soul who passed away recently in the last couple of years. But 
huge Clemson D tackle. Yes, that's what really awesome about. player. Yep. And like literally was like an uncle to me. And there were guys like on his D line, like Nolan Harrison, who's a guy who you might not remember as much. Um, but like Nolan would come over to the house and was like a little brother to my dad. And, you know, Nolan gave me all his N64 games. So you talk about I'm complaining about some of the negatives, the pressure. I got a bunch of fucking N64 games. Mm -hmm. So actually, let me take that back. Yeah, it's all sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> so no, but like, um, you know, my dad had mentors when he came in the league. And I think one of the biggest things about playing the game and one of the things I enjoyed at the end of my career uh when the political bullshit of like you're old you're not making as much money it's like the movies they're trying to get you out yeah like i loved one part of my day and that's dealing with the younger players and like yeah. passing it on and he had a couple guys that passed it on to him and he was always the same way to younger players that's cool i respect i i enjoy actually the 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 part of that in our world of like you know whenever i get a chance to interact with young comics who like are yeah. asking about you know whether it's like creative things or business things it's fun it's fun to pass it on like to yeah and and also like it challenges you i feel like because you're really close to somebody that's you're trying to take your job yeah and i'm not saying it's the same way in the world of comedy sure, sure you know you're all your own you know independent contractors i don't know but yeah. like as teammates there's only two defensive ends on the field right and so it's kind of counterintuitive for me to try to help Derek barnett but i don't know a way to be the other way yeah yeah i just course. don't and i'm glad i don't you know i had vets in my career who were really great vets and i had some that also didn't give a fuck about me intentionally because they might have resented me because i was a high pick or yep. because maybe i was going to take their job and i just remember how those two things made me feel and i'm like there's nothing more insecure than fucking you know stepping on somebody that's trying to come up yes that you're totally right that just reeks of your insecurity i think yeah, yeah. yeah and in, in in comedy it's definitely gross where it's like you can't handle another funny person around like the fuck man <laughs> i got bad news there's yeah. a lot of funny yeah. motherfuckers you're, out you're here yeah big problems man yeah. uh, what before i move on to your thing uh uh i have to ask just because you mentioned him you had fucking bo jackson yeah in your kid did your dad tell you bo jackson's like do you guys ever does he ever bring him yeah, up i mean my dad just kind of it's very rare that my dad like sits back and sinks in his chair and my dad's one of the greatest storytellers you ever meet. I mean, if you played on the the Raiders in the eighties and you weren't, I would think you kind of suck at telling stories, yeah. but he crushes it. And, you know, he has that magnetism where everybody kind of leans in mm -hmm. and uh, Bo is one of the subjects of many of his stories. And Bo oh. is different though, because my dad is also kind of a spectator when he tells those stories, you know, like you can see him talking like he's a fan of somebody yeah. where usually it's this experience, my peer, this guy I played that was pretty good. Like we had battles. I mean, Anthony Munoz and him are on the same wavelength and he's talking about a legend like Munoz and it's his head to head battle. They're getting up for each other. Yeah. But like Bo Jackson, he talks about like, is like an alien. Like, like an he's alien. Just, he's just yeah. a different human being. And he's also a really good dude. And my dad says, you know, like Bo's quiet. He's not gonna, he's not gonna, you know, he's not gonna have a podcast like us. Yeah. But he's a fucking real guy and a good friend and a good teammate and a humble guy too. And kind of reclusive kind of stays to himself. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's, it's just that like, it is wild. I always remind myself and other people that when you see like the aliens, like the, those freaky dudes like that, you forget sometimes at home that the people that it looks like he's embarrassing are fucking professionals. Like they're he, also aliens. They, they're exactly like, like when people are like, oh, Bo Jackson dusted that fool. It's like, yeah, that fool would absolutely ruin your life. The, the guy boss that he embarrassed. Was the biggest alien in a whole field full of aliens yeah. in, in college football. Like there's just every every level like deserves respect. That's why, yes. you know, you talk about guys that, you know, in football that don't pan out or something. Like I've had teammates that were high picks and like we're out of league in a couple of years and people look at them as like that's a failure. But yeah. like those guys succeeded by even getting there. Like of they're course. freaks of nature. They, it took them a lot of hard work. When you see somebody who's dominant in the NFL, you should never take that for granted. Yeah. Because it is, you have to be so transcendently consistent and good to be like a hall of famer. Yeah. You know, like my best year, if I did that for 10, 11 years, I'm a hall of famer. The hard part is doing, it doing over that and over. over and over yeah. and over again. And that's why the, the greats are so like, priceless yeah it's it's incredible can i ask you because i i personally love i love college football like as yeah. i as i grew up like you know it started as an nfl love and then 
in like once I discovered, I don't know what it was. Like I discovered college ball and like my dad liked college. You always kind of gravitate. I think when you're a kid, what your dad's into and yeah. I, he loved college ball. So I really, I mean, I still, to this day, I watch NFL games that, you know, it's, 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 it is entertainment for me, but like college I get into and I love learning about people's recruiting, like how, so you're like a, you know, a stud <laughs> player in high school. You end up in Virginia. Like I'm personally, I'm a big FSU fan. So I was always yeah. well-versed in what's going on in the ACC. And yeah. like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting choice. Cause you go like, well, Dude, you know, <laughs> I look back and think the same thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad I made, you know, it's, I'm glad I made it, but it was out of left field. Kind of like what you're saying. So did you, and did you take your five visits? Did you, you know what I mean? Did you so open that's, it up? That's a great question, man, because like recruiting has changed first and foremost. Like yeah. nowadays we had Devonte Smith on my pod last week, the Bama receiver who's now an yeah. Eagle uh -huh. and you know, the, just him painting a picture of how cutthroat and competitive these skill camps are now. Oh my God. Where guys are driving in, sleeping in their cars, like competing in these seven on seven camps. The game has totally changed. How about these like back kids in the that, day? They get offers in like seventh grade. They're like, I think that's incredible. I fast. mean, we're getting like, into hockey or yeah. baseball territory or some like, you yeah. know, siphon skill sport. But I just think, man, like, when it comes to Virginia, I live in Charlottesville. I grew up here, mm -hmm. and that was probably the best shot they had of landing, like me personally. I'm not saying somebody like me because we had a lot of four- and five-star recruits. It just was that I, I'm i kind of a hometown guy. Yep. I, I, I like, you know, I moved to Virginia when I was eight, and that was really like, I hate to be like I was traumatic for a kid, but it fucking sucks to move across the country yeah. and start over with new friends. So I really like planted my roots. And I just didn't want to, I just love Charlottesville and I love like being able to drive to my parents' house, get laundry done. I like seeing my parents. They don't suffocate me where I feel like I got to get away to go to college. Yep. My parents are cool. Yeah. And they also had drop ceilings in high school and were, were heavy sleepers so we could drink and party and put the liquor bottles up in the- Fantastic. But, yeah. yeah. So, so I never felt like the need to like fuck off and go somewhere sure. and be like, I need to, I just, I thought about FSU I thought about UNC. I didn't think I was good enough to go to FSU. I didn't like my UNC visit because they kind of blew me off until they found out I was Howie's son. Then Virginia Tech, I, I hated the fucking architecture, which sounds stupid as hell. Really? I think I would have been depressed. Uh, By the, like they, the campus architecture? Dude, go, Google like the, the dorms at Virginia Tech. They look like a prison. And yes, I would have beaten Virginia four times in four years. I get it. We never beat Tech. <laughs> yeah. But still, dude, I would have been depressed in beating Virginia. Come so, on, man. Metallica? They, they couldn't win you over with the fucking... Now, the, that shit is... Enter Sandman, I'll say, is, is I wanna, incredible. I've always... like as a, as, a, like a, as a college football fan, one of the things I want to do is like go to a Thursday night game in Blacksburg just, just to... Because I've seen that on TV. So I'm like, this looks fucking nuts. I get goosebumps watching it at home. I get nauseous and then like a half a goosebump. Yeah. And you know, like, and my my kids two and five yeah. like love love music and they love like grown up music and they really like heavy metal. And the first time they heard Enter Sandman, they started sprinting around and I was like, Alexa, turn it off. <laughs> you know, like yeah, like dude, Fuck no. Tech. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, got exactly. It. But I still like the the. They, I got to give credit where credit's due. I hate them, but I respect them. I've always said that. Yes. I hate Maryland. I don't respect Maryland. Okay. There's the difference. There's, that's a big difference. Hey, Maryland, yeah. fuck you. <laughs> yeah. They fucked off and went to the big time. Okay. I like it. Um, so you entertain these schools, but then was it, a, was it a pretty easy decision in the end then? Yes. Sounds like it was. Yes. Okay. I took my first offer. I'm sorry. I, I took wow. my first offer. I didn't take, I took an unofficial visit to UNC. So I never got Were you like, kind of, because that's a beautiful champ. I've been to Chapel Hill. That's a beautiful campus. It's like Charlottesville. Yeah. It's got a lot of Charlottesville similarities. And so I really liked it and I was having a great day, but a coach was like, uh, I heard a coach go over and whisper to this other coach who will go unnamed and was like, Hey, we got this guy over here, Chris Long from Charlottesville. And he was like, yeah, I don't have time for him. And he, oh. he was like, that's how we long son. And then he was like, Oh, and he shot right over. And, oh, you know, gave gross. Me oh, yeah. and so I was like, you know what? No big deal. Like I get it, but they yeah. don't really like me for me. Right. And UNC, uh, you know, we ended up kicking their ass. So it was all good. But Al Gro was my college coach and he was just so no bullshit under the radar. He was like a pro mindset. Yeah. And I took the first offer and I also, I didn't want to be one of these guys that, uh, that made it a big deal. So I just sure. kind of did it and got it over with. That's yeah. That's so different than like a lot of, uh, highly recruited guys like yourself, like, like five-star guys, 
Now they do. It's like a reality show. I mean, they they draw that shit out and they're like, hmm, I'm releasing a top 10 list tomorrow. And then oh like, I mean, God. they just keep, they draw it out. And then I'm going to announce it Tuesday on ESPN. And it's like, a, they're going to be going mock, mock top 10 soon. Like kids are going to yeah. be coming out with their own. Like I just, or commitment thing, and then withdrawing the commitment. And like, you know, listen, if you get three hats and this was the sweet spot was three hats. Okay. That yeah. we all liked that. It was cool. It was respectful. And then all of a sudden, like it turned into seven hats and you started doing the trick. The oh, trick yeah. They start with messing the with them and, or they go, uh, no. And they pick up the other hat. Minor, just, it, we're like at a minor league baseball game yeah, on yeah. the Jumbotron. Like, where's the baseball hidden? And yeah. at, at a certain point when you realize that, like, so few college football players actually end up being any good, like maybe you should hedge your bets and kind of chill. Yes, I, I agree. It, that it gets a little too, like, cartoonish, the recruiting thing now, you know? It's, and it's, and every not every coach, but it's like such a wild scene. Like it's it's the SEC especially. It's just like it feels like there's a lot of car salesman type personalities. Yeah, I don't know. You watch Eastbound and Down, probably. Yeah. So I just feel like there's a lot of Ashley Schaefer's out there. <laughs> yeah, dude. You know what I mean? Yes. And they're not selling Kias. They're coaches. And there's just this whole song and dance. And there's there's under the table payments and shit, which you don't get at Virginia. Virginia was a totally clean p place. Because we weren't the main event here. Like right. Olympic sports are great here, lacrosse, basketball, the whole nine yards. So we never got that preferential treatment. But now kids are just getting like babied so much. And I'm not trying to sound like the old man yelling at the cloud. Yeah. I want them to get paid. I want them to get fucking money for their likeness. I just think the fucking ego shit is out of control. It's a, it totally is. The other thing that, always, that stands out to me now about like just being a, f a fan of the sport is that you go like, man, and I understand that this is, it's competition. Every, every school is trying to get the best players, but it feels like that there is just a pipeline into Bama, Clemson, Ohio State, and, uh, you know, m maybe, I don't know, LSU or something. And you're like, yeah, I don't think there's enough good players to make this an even play. Like, they're all going to, like, these right. four schools. And like, Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's really hard. I mean, and and it you almost can't remember what college football was like before it i guess it was just different schools it was florida state and florida you yeah know, every year every was, and you'd have like you know ucla would be like colorado it, it seemed like the top 25 you're like these are familiar and it's shuffling now i feel like it is a top five sport and that everybody out of the top five is like just forget it you're definitely not going to win this thing and we're just watching these three schools and we'll see which one of them pulls it off it's funny because the whole thing is predicated on every game matters, even though now we've had a playoff and so you yes. could lose and still make it. But every game matters for certain Power Five conferences just so you can punch your ticket to another a formality, really. I mean, mm -hmm. like that playoff, there have been so few competitive games. Go look it up. There's been like, you know, less than 15% of those games are like one score games. And, and that's just like, I'd rather have the playoff for sure mm -hmm. than the BCS. But it is what it is at this point. It is what it is. Did you and your brother, like, so, you know, your father's an NFL player, your brother's yeah. an NFL. Did you guys fuck each other up as kids? <laughs> so not so much because we were like, almost, we were about four years, a little under four years apart. Okay. And my youngest brother, Howie, and Kyle are like Irish twins. So they used to fuck each other up. Okay. The only catch here is that Howie's standard height, six foot, you know, regular uh, size dude. And Kyle is six foot seven. Yeah. 330 with abs and yeah. like so those fights how he didn't win them all but how he fought them all he did <laughs> yeah yeah how he must be tough as fuck if he's getting oh he's a tough yeah. guy yeah. he's a tough guy he's a tough guy but yeah kyle's tough as shit too and he's also big which is you know it's yeah, just huge. unfair yeah unfair did you got uh you because yeah you have played in games together because i remember you pulled you pulled him off of somebody what you jumped on for like See, i pulled him off my best friend so <laughs> when when he came to chicago yeah or when Chicago came to St. Louis and uh, we played for the first time, I, one of my best friends' name is William Hayes. You should Google him, Tom, and that's eventually probably have him on your podcast. Yeah. He's the funniest person I've ever met. Sure. He believes in mermaids. He doesn't believe in dinosaurs. You probably saw him. I think he went on Jimmy Kimmel's show because when the Rams moved to L.A., all this under-the-radar content, which was escaping the media in St. Louis. Hold on a second. <laughs> yeah. You need to book this guy right fucking now. Okay. Sorry. This guy believes that mermaids are real? Absolutely, dude. <laughs> All that damn water out there that you, you mean to tell me there ain't one fucking half fish, half woman <laughs> swimming around in that motherfucker? That's what he told me. Okay. And I'll never forget it. 
and I saw the look in his eye. And we're like best friends. I yeah. love William so much, dude. But yeah. there's just some things that we don't agree on. I'm not sure. into the mermaid thing. Yeah. Um, but what were, where were we? Well, we were at um, yo, know, your brother, your brother and oh, William. Yeah. So so basically, we all went to Vegas together. William, Kyle, really the whole D line. We do like a Memorial Day trip at one of those pools, like rehab. Yeah. Which you know what? It's just like it's a good time. Yeah. nights night night like lights yeah, out at yeah. noon and yeah. so we were all like best buddies i took kyle with our d line the, the year he was getting drafted and then his rookie year he comes to st louis and william's an agitator and kyle is a fucking grizzly bear and you know you know what what it's like with two bears yeah you know it's you get yeah. Sorry. you're like not there you're like I, looking I, for the two bears you're I, I was i was looking for the other logo sorry that's incredible yeah. you know you're successful and you're like oh, which podcast is it? <laughs> <laughs> i uh but fucking uh kyle just snapped and it's a stressful week because like listen as hard as i had it growing up being dad's son you know kyle had a big brother too that was like yeah you know doing pretty good and yeah so this was a big week for him he wanted to play well he's a good young player and the tensions were high we had like 30 people in town and william pushed him over the brink and he snapped and he literally is just pummeling william's head under the pile through the through the face mask and i know it doesn't look good so i run off the sideline because i wasn't in for that play i was getting a rest and i go to grab kyle's jersey and he's so strong he goes to like just shrug me off and his jersey just rips like the jersey ripped before he moved dude and when i tell you it took six guys to drag him off of william it was an ugly sight holy shit an ugly sight. Did he get and tossed? Let, let me tell you he didn't get tossed no. and let me tell you what the worst part was all those 30 motherfuckers that came to the game, guess who had to entertain them after the game? Oh, that was fun, huh? Me, and yeah. everybody's in a bad mood. So thank you, Kyle. <laughs> Sounds like you're still holding on to that one. <laughs> I am a little bit. It was the most awkward day, but I get it, though. He was a young player. He had the worst instigator uh, lined up across from in the league in William Hayes. Did you, now how about you, because you seem like, you know, you're like, you you have a good head on your shoulders and you understand, you know, a lot of, as, like all aspects of this game. How are you, at handling like provocation like do did people try to you know what i mean provoke you my for me to get really angry and it can happen no no one ever used my anger against me i yeah. mean i got ejected like once or twice but i'm not like some terrible hothead and I also like if I start getting mad at certain players and not others which is going to happen if somebody says like the wrong wrong thing like yeah then I'm picking and choosing who I want to like, like just get after out there. And, and that's not kind of how you want to play the game. So I just try to come into it and like make up reasons that you think like the whole stupid ass Michael Jordan thing. And I'm a, not, I'm a terrible player compared to Michael Jordan. So I hate to even like, Oh, I use that from the last dance. But like you do fucking, you tell yourself things, right? You do make shit up in your head. You, yeah. you, you know, like at your best, like our worst rivalries, which I say I wasn't doing this, but like you tried not to, but like the Niners, there was this guy named Anthony Davis and I fucking convinced myself that I hated him. I don't hate a lot of people, but if I can convince myself, I hate somebody and that's I'm going to hate do. him. And yeah. And so that's kind of the way you would, if you're not naturally like a hateful person, like you just find a way to use it to your advantage. But honestly, what I would do is try to push somebody's button back. I like if you if you ask somebody to play with me, I'm not the guy who gets mad. I'm the guy who gets people mad. And is your way of getting some uh, somebody mad through what you're doing, like your st your style of play, or through like trash talk, like saying things to them? Style of play because I'm annoying because I don't stop. I mean, I'm not the best player of all time. I was pretty damn good, but I wasn't. My strength was just hustle and that type of thing yeah so it's probably annoy you sometimes that way but i would say more just like the the well-placed barb mm -hmm. you know like and i know what that might be before i play you or um i've heard stories about somebody and i'll push a button that you know they oh right so you will but so you're holding on to that you're going into this game with a little bit yeah of a, like yeah. i'm not gonna pull that out unless you're being a douchebag and if yeah. you're being a douchebag then i'm gonna get you really mad and offensive linemen usually take d linemen out of our games like if you can you got to take the o linemen out of the game yeah sure do you have um like because part of your game i'm assuming as a, as a style of play is that you'd also mix it up right like because certain players they're just like you just know this dude's gonna he's just gonna his spin move or he's just gonna swim every time whatever yep. but you you would like having such a well versed spread out game you could yeah. keep them guessing right like that's the best well, like, we don't know what he's gonna do 
I think, you know, you're okay. What makes Von Miller is like ridiculous, right? Ridiculous. Like, he can touch the ground at full speed and turn his hips and his ankles sideways. Like he's yeah. any edge rusher would want. Like if you, it's a perfect example of watching film of somebody and trying to emulate it, which is something that coaches do a really poor job of is like, Hey, watch this all time. Great. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I can't do what he does. Right. Like you just showed me a, a tape of Von Miller touching the ground at yeah. full speed. I can't do that. Um, you got to find out what your weaknesses are before you can like really find out what your strengths are. And that's not some like karate shit. It's just some like, yeah. actually it makes sense just from you have to know what you suck at. And once you know that you can be really good at the stuff. What was your at. greatest and, weakness? My greatest weakness was probably the bend at the top of the the rush for me. Okay. Um, and maybe a little bit of arm length, but the bend at the top of the rush, like the being able to do what Von Miller, I just described doing. Uh -huh. Robert Quinn, who I played opposite of, our games were very different. He had a 19 sack year, saw it with my own eyes. It was incredible. We were a bad team, we didn't have leads. What he does is he runs sideways on his fucking, like on the outside of his knee. He's an alien. like. Yeah. I just know that's not going to happen for me. So uh -huh. I have to work like a process that works for me. And usually it stems from the threat of speed because I'm quick with a counter. So your counters have to be good, you know, like a spin mm -hmm. or, you know, an inside move or a power rush with good timing um, becomes a counter. And then on top of that, just power. And as you get older, you learn how to use your, your leverage better. So like, yeah, this is like next level, like pass rush shit. So yeah, I morning, love it. I love it. Okay, so if I was going to go try to bull rush somebody with arms that were eight inches longer than mine, I wouldn't go in here like this. I'm going to get trapped, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to get trapped. My arms are just like eight inches longer than his. Now, if I go sideways, my surface then not only rotates, but it's further away. Yeah. And so, like, little things like that. That's brilliant. That I love can, that. You know what I mean? Like, that's a little technique that you have to work if you have deficiencies. But before you can work it, you have to know what your deficiencies sure. are. And it and sounds like that's a vet thing, right? Like, vets were doing stuff like this. Vets were. So, like, you know, when I got in the league, Leonard Little taught me to turn my hips, which I wasn't good at, right? Because I was, like, a 3-4 end in college, so I would rush on the edge, but not that much. And uh, I needed a mechanism, so I learned the, the side scissors, like a swipe, which basically turns my hips and gets the hands down. And it's just that little like, oh, that's what I'm not good at. That's what I need to fix. And as you get older and slower and shittier, you also change your your process. Yeah. Who you have to be you, honest. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, that's probably one of, like, that's what separates, I think, good and great players from probably everybody else is even wanting to examine your weaknesses and saying, this is what I need to get better. Because it's uncomfortable for people to go, I'm not good at this, you know, at this part of my game. I think the best thing you can have, like, in anything is somebody to tell you when you suck. I totally and agree. You got to have it. And like, whether it's you and me doing a podcast, which like, you know, like I'll be like, Hey Reed, who's probably back there right now. Reed, you still back there? He's not back there. He just left the fucking room. I'm talking Reed's to gone, nobody. <laughs> Reed hates the sound of my voice probably. <laughs> so he left. Yeah. But you know, like you, you need somebody like a producer or a friend to tell you like, Hey, that was, ass or like oh, that yeah. thing you do is annoying dude in yes and in stand-up the biggest gift are your friends will be like yeah that joke's all right man or like you know that, that joke sounds a lot like and then you know you would have not uh, faced it or maybe you just wouldn't have been aware of it and then you go wait for real at first it like hurts you're like fuck you you know but then you sit there and you're like really and they're like yeah i mean that just sounds just like this and you're like all right and then you end up with a better bit like you end yeah. up doing something better and you go Oh, I realized what a favorite it was that my friend was like, that shit's okay. Or that, that sucked, you know? And it's also not taking it like, and I'm sure for you, like a, a comic might tell you. And so in a way he could try to do what he's talking about executing, but like the ultimate is like somebody that doesn't know what goes into it. It's so easy to be defensive when like yes. a buddy is like that sucked or like yeah. your producer. And you could be like, oh, you don't know what it's like to sit up here and have to fucking drive this bus or like yeah, yeah. be funny or like, bring it when you don't have it but if you're not defensive about it that's when you actually get better and i feel like it's the same way with football is like me having a teammate that could tell me because you always i don't know if you do this with shows there's a saying in football with film that it's never as good as you as it as you thought and it's never as bad as you thought it is exactly what we tell it's what you tell like a young comic especially like when they start kind of getting some heat and stuff and you start seeing them getting high and low you go look 
you ne you're never as good as you think you are and you're never as bad as you think you are. And you should never get as high off of the great shows or as low off of the bad shows. The whole idea, like the best way to get through this is to kind of keep, e keep an even temperament about great shows and bad shows. Like you're not as good as that standing ovation, crazy ass reaction. Like you're good, but it's like that was over the top. And if they fucking boo you, that's ridiculous too. You know, and don't don't get bummed out. Stay in the middle. So how the fuck do you that when you wake up the day after you bomb a show, like occasionally, I'm sure maybe you do yeah, every yeah, once in sure. a while. I don't know. Like it's I, the worst. Listen, bombing absolutely sucks. It is a it really is a horrible, horrible feeling. I mean, I don't know what to liken it to because it's like it's like this thing, it's not even like a loss. It's not like you played a game and you lost. It's like you played a game and they they took your clothes off and they fucked you at the 50 yard line in front of the <laughs> opposing players mothers. That's what it feels like. Okay. Bombing feels like your soul was ripped out from inside. It's, it is the worst feeling. Now what the, the, the only, every comedian will tell you this too. The only way, the only way to truly wash off a bomb is to have a, a good set. So the, what you're actually looking forward to the most after you bomb is having another set where it goes well. And you're like, Oh my God, Thank God that that feeling isn't my, the bombing isn't my last feeling. It's this good show. But then it lets you examine like, why did I bomb? Because it, there's a, a whole bunch of reasons that you can bomb. You know, you could be unprepared. You could be lazy. You could be distracted. You could be not focused. It could be, uh, there's other circuit, you know, it could be that there's, you know, I don't know, somebody really drunk. Maybe you, you, you got angry. That's another thing. You can get upset. You know, somebody heckles you. And we always, yeah. I always try to remember this. I think it was Gary Shandling that was like, when somebody uh, yells something or, or you get heckled, like um, get funny instead of get angry. Cause it, it sounds kind of silly, but it's like in the moment, if somebody says something and you want to go, Hey, shut the fuck up, you know, like that's coming from anger and mm -hmm. it might silence them. It might work. People might be like, all right, we're not going to heckle this dude. But then but they're laughing fake. Yeah, then they're like, ha, ha this guy's violent, you know? But <laughs> yeah. That but, was me at the front of, and I wasn't laughing fake when I saw Ricky Smiley and Mike Epps, uh -huh. but I went in Jacksonville, yeah. and I was like in the front row, and you know, like, I was like, man, I'm definitely gonna get it. I'm like the lone white guy here. Yeah. And I remember this one point, I all I got was grazed by Mike Epps, and he was like, you white motherfuckers right there know what I mean. Yeah. And I was like, whew. Yeah. But I was laughing like that sometimes. I was like, ha ha ha. ha. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course, of course. But it always feels better as the comedian. Somebody says something and you're like, you kind of let this moment, like this moment happen where you're like, oh, I'm not upset. And I'm, I'm not going to get upset. And you, your comedic mind kind of takes over. And then you say something unemotional and you have a much better shot at being funny unemotionally than you do emotionally. Because emotionally, you're leaning towards being upset. I mean, someone's interrupting you, you know? So you're leaning towards being like, shut up. But if you can stay in that space of like loose, kind of loose focus, right. but loose, you can say something funny. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, you're being comedic, which is what you want to do in those moments. But dude, bombing, bombing is, it's- Dude, I just can't even imagine because it's like you said, not a bad game. You know, um, bad game is bad. I don't even want to go in like Whole Foods or whatever. Yeah. but you know, like nobody, even though they conflate it with my personality, it's not a reflection on my personality, even though like manhood and personality is like, I don't know which yeah. one I'd rather somebody like go at, which is a weird thing and it's stupid, but, um, you know, like people are making a, a judgment on something that I'm doing that is really hard and has nothing to do with who I am. But yes. I feel like if you're doing comedy, it's like, they don't like me. Yes. It's what it feels. And the other thing is you, you actually learn over time. At first you go, no, for sure. They don't like me. They don't like me. Yeah. As you get older, you realize that it's not that they don't like you. It's that they don't like your comedy, you know, because right. I'm like, I'm not like me as a human being is not who like the comedian. So I, I actually go like, if someone doesn't like my comedy, I'm so comfortable with that. Somebody not liking yeah. me as a person is more offensive to me. You know, I'd be like, well, I, I don't understand why, you, like what I did as a person, you know? Oh, ooh, I got a question then. Fucking, you know, I find 10% of what I see funny, not from you, I'm talking about from people. I think yeah. you're funny like 88% of the time from the small, you know, the yes. samples. I think you're fucking, you're nine out of 10. Yeah. All right. Some people I don't find funny. And I'm sure some people in your industry you don't find funny. Sure. Like, and your boys with them, maybe. Yeah. Like, how open are people to be like, yeah, I'm not really into your stuff. 
No, they're not. People don't do that. <laughs> we are such crybabies. We're so sensitive. Like if you said that to a com- if you were like, you're pretty cool, but I just don't dig your shit. They'd be like, <laughs> they would just fucking oh, break yeah. down. Oh, yeah, no. And I, Cause it's so hard. It's so hard. What you do is motherfucker could be not that funny to somebody and could be funny to 99% of people. That's what you, you learn that that's a reality that being a comedian is equivalent to uh, in normal times, the movies like right, a movie theater is open and there are 10 movies at the theater. There's a drama, there's some comedy, there's a thriller, there's a horror film. There's, you know, there's a kid's film and you realize that people show up to the movies and they go, this is what I feel like. I feel like this flavor. This is the genre yeah. that I want going like comedians are essentially like that. There are those movies. There's the, the, you know, there's the dry guy. There's the, like, there's the ranty angry guy. There's the, they're just like, it's like a different flavor. So it's like, I, I try to look at the comedy like that where I go, yeah, you know, this person, this comedian doesn't do it for me but they clearly do it for all these other people. Like this, the guy has a huge fan base. So he yeah. is funny. It just doesn't resonate with me. And then I don't, I try not to think about how much they, they don't do it for me. You know what I mean? I, I try not to go like, I just don't find it. I just, I try to enjoy the guy at that point for his personality and what right. he's like to hang. That's why comedians were always like, you know, I care way more what this dude's like to hang out with than what he's like on stage. As much as I yes. respect great com- comedians and their comedy, it's like if you're great on stage, but you're a piece of shit or you're an asshole in the green room, then I don't care about your comedy. You know, yes. I'm not going to re- I'm not going to like you. And also, I can sit there and smile and not laugh out loud at something and be like, oh, that, I like the narrative yeah. that he's yes. bringing to the table. It's on this. Still like, I like enjoyable. the way he's it's not funny, but like he, uh, he's smart as shit or something. Yes. Like, you mentioned movies. What's the worst movie of all time? The since worst you brought up- movie of all time. Oh, man. Um, what was that? Tiptoes? Uh the fuck is tiptoes, dude? <laughs> is that what it's called? I don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That that's the worst movie of all time. You never seen this? No. Yeah. Uh, we gotta. Okay, can we play Who's the trailer for him? I love bad movies. Who's in it? Has can he? Dude, it's an incredible cast. Gary Oldman, Matthew McConaughey. Um. Uh. Was it, who else is in that? Can you pull that up? He's pulling it. Hold on one yeah, second. Yeah. One second. It is. It is an un believable cast <laughs> Tip i love right? bad movies what's your wait Mortal- what's your favorite worst movie my favorite bad movie is probably simon says if you're looking for a deep cut it's uh-huh. the dennis rodman flick that they threw a couple million dollars at and shot in like europe and fucking i think dax shepherd i don't want to butcher this is in yeah. the thing really and i'm like somebody popular was in it that i was like you have no business being in this movie why would you be like yeah i want to go do this with dennis rodman i don't like, know why uh, wait, can, Lady in the can Water he, was just bad, bad. I walked out of that one. I walked out of Van Helsing, but wait, Mortal what Kombat in the water? one. What's what? Lady the, in the Water. La- Lady in the Water. Suck. Is that the one? M Night Shyamalan. Oh yeah, I also didn't actually. I feel like I rented that after, and I um I didn't even finish it. Yeah, oh, no. most people didn't finish it. Oh. Hey, <laughs> also, huh, that's <laughs> hey, you're supporting me. All right, another one. Mortal Kombat is the best of all time, probably as best far as bad like, movie. Just, the, yes, it's so. You know, some funny. of the hits from the '90s you watch now, you're like, "This is a piece of garbage." Like things. That, oh yeah, seems you're that were about... like hot and like a lot of a lot of like that action genre stuff. Oh, yeah. It is so silly now. It's so goofy. It feels mm-hmm. like it's in a time capsule, and it feels ridiculous. And the whole thing feels the premise is ridiculous. The writing, the acting, the cost. It's like. The whole thing is cartoon. Like basically like all those Seagal movies, like they all are insane. Oh yeah. They're so is, crazy. Uh, is it Time Cop? Is, yeah, that's Time Cop. Cop Land is Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. The one that aged beautifully, which which is one of my favorite movies of all time is Predator. Amazing. That is the first rated R movie that I ever saw. I saw it in a hotel room with my dad. So I did like a father son trip and I'm like eight or nine. And he was like, you want to watch predator? And I was like, what's predator? And he was like, eight or nine. I I don't know what my age, but he goes, he goes, uh, he goes, don't tell your mother. And then he just ordered it and we watched it. And I was like, this is fucking awesome, man. I just, I was amazed by that movie. Yeah, dude. My, it's funny. I thought of it for the second time this pod. Cause earlier you were talking about like my football. That was like, you know, the thing that I copied my dad doing. My yeah. dad liked Arnold movies. Oh, yeah. And your, so your dad looks like his fucking stunt double. He looked well, it'd be hard to be Arnold's stunt double because he's like six inches taller than him. But it's oh, true, yeah. that fucking flat top. 
Yep. Hasn't changed in years. Yeah. Hasn't same, changed. Dude. Imagine being so good looking that you're just like, hmm, flat top. Flat top. Fuck those guys. Yeah. <laughs> like, would you rather have that or your your head, your hair? Bald head. Would you rather be bald or have a flat top? Bald. <laughs> yeah. And listen, he fucking pulls it off. I know. It's, he just it's fucking silly. pulls it off. It's ridiculous. This is twice I've lamented how good looking my dad is. Oh yeah. No, no. And I I I resent him as well. Just so you know. You have you have a, a brother in arms here. I resent your father and his good looks. Now I think his acting career, I think he was too good looking for Broken Arrow. I agree. I agree. Christian Slater, that's why I kicked him out of the fucking train, because he's not only better looking than Christian Slater, he's also more macho, and Christian couldn't take it, so they wrote that shit and kicked my dad out of a moving train. It's Go. called being insecure, Christian. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have Tiptoes trailer. Would you like to watch it? I'd love to watch the Tiptoes okay. trailer. Please play the Tiptoes trailer. Tiptoes. <laughs> hey, dude. Dude, it doesn't even hey. seem like a real movie, does it Hold not? Hold on a second. The thing that got me is at the end, they get through that whole fucking ridiculous thing, which everybody signed off on that, okay? Yeah. And the guy in Interstellar, who's one of my favorite, like in Mud and all that shit, was in a movie with little people, like completely. And then at the end of it, they say, in the role of a lifetime, Gary Oldman. Yeah. The, and, and also, it sounds like <laughs> they got like a high school kid to do the voiceover. Like it didn't even sound like a real voiceover guy. He was like, and in the role of a lifetime, Gary Oldman, oh. tiptoes. <laughs> it's such bull. I, can't, I could not. I thought the it was first, a sketch. I thought it the was first a. first scene looks like when you, in the 90s, you turned on your, your VCR slash like old school TV in your hotel room, and they played like the instructions of how to get around the hotel. Yes. That is exactly. That's what that looked like that's to me. <laughs> that's right. Like, <laughs> when you turn it on, they're like, here's the hotel layout. Like, no, adult yeah. movies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm on yeah. a field trip. Yeah, I don't yeah. need to know how to get around the hotel. It's, a, yeah, it's exactly right. <laughs> so I'm sending you a signed copy of Tiptoes. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> hey, you got to watch Simon Says. Okay. I'll watch Simon okay. Says. Who stars right. in that? Dennis Rodman. Oh, that's right. Hold right, on. Right. Yeah. You know what? I'm surprised. Fucking Rotten Tomatoes. They got 20% out of these motherfuckers. 20%? Uh, for this movie. That That's seems generous. damn good. <laughs> Have you ever seen Hold the on. ones where they're like 6%? You're like, wow. That's like yeah, everybody dude. hated this. Like Simon says, these are the ones you want to watch. Uh, 0%, I think, on Rotten Zero Tomatoes. 0%? Somehow. I'm just telling you, this is the depths of the depth. It's Dane Cook. Dane Cook is in here. Okay. He's in that? With yeah, I was like, dang, Cook, what the fuck are you doing, man? Ten million dollar budget? Well, yeah. you got to throw money at these a athletes. You got to do like a shack budget if you want to. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's <laughs> oh, all right. Simon says, putting it down. <laughs> Please do. Uh, I want to ask you uh, a a couple other. I want to ask you a football question. You're good. Of of the because I always want to know. You know, I know you guys, you're pro, so you're obviously, you know, you're, you guys are the best players on the planet, mm -hmm. but going, let's say, you know, season after season, was there one person who you knew every season, you're like, this dude's going to, this game, this dude's going to give me the business. All oh, yeah. you get, you prep a little more or you're oh, like, yeah. you just get yourself amped up for it because you know, he's going to like bring it. Yeah, yeah. I was I was only smiling because I was still laughing at Gary Holman. Yeah, well, it was the role of a lifetime. I mean, yeah. Well, <laughs> he said it so like, Marshawn Lynch was the guy, dude. Really? You know, linemen, they're matchup problems. So somebody that I might hate playing against, it was just a weird matchup. Like yeah. somebody who's got a weird body type for me. Like fights make, or styles make fights, right? Yeah. Same thing with a pass rush matchup. So like, you could play you know, one of the best all time. And it's just not a good matchup for him. And he might get beat for three sacks by the worst player sure. or vice versa. Okay. Um, so a lot of the problem is like a lot of times guards will move out to tackle in like emergency situations. And you're like, this guy's, this guy's Orlando pace. Like, yeah. Cause he's fucking so unorthodox. Um, I would say Marshawn Lynch though, because Rams Seahawks, you know, if I could call it a rivalry, it wasn't as far as like, being relevant because we weren't very fucking good but one thing we were going to do was beat up on the seahawks up front yeah like and marshawn did not have big holes to run through but the thing about marshawn is it really takes two three guys for real and every time you played him you just respected the way he brought it and you know i talk a lot about this like 
my favorite jersey that I got to trade was like Marshawn's. You know, not a lineman, yeah. you know, not a defensive player. You know, it's just there's certain backs that you can't help but respect. It's that pu- that was, punishing run one. style, like where it just you're like, man, this guy. And he he had so much fucking fun. And yeah. I'm sure like you could talk to a thousand players that played him. He was having fun, and it made you want to compete harder, and that was good, because yeah. because you need to compete harder, and you need to you need to get there with a little bit more intention, and you need to bring the whole the whole gang because he's not going down with one person. Right. That's cool. You know, Adrian Peterson would punish the fuck out of a second level defender, but wasn't like if I tackled him for a loss, it wasn't like oh, what the fuck just happened to my shoulder. Like with Marshawn in the tackle box, it took a million people. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you, you see it to a degree when you're watching, you're like, this, it looks like a brutal run. And also you're like, doesn't he ever get tired of this? God damn. Like, just, I don't, I don't think, I just think to him, you know, everybody, I think one thing about his mentality is like I said, he's having fun. He's in the backyard playing football. Yeah. And I think football can be so pressure packed and regimented that you can yeah. get two in your own head and like, you know, that can kind of wear you down too, being mentally like yeah. not loose. Yeah. And he just is never, yeah, he's always having fun. He's yeah, locked I, in. He's somebody who like, I, I think about that too, or you, you kind of want to go like, hey, how did you keep this uh, mentality? Like this yeah. fun, loose thing? Because you know, at the higher levels of things, it's a business and everything gets serious. And you got, you know, he's out there eating fucking Skittles and shit on the sideline, laughing and having fun. It, it It's cool. I like it. And even in interviews, he seems like very... Like, didn't seem like he would take, I mean, if he was willing to talk, then it seemed like he was yeah. having a good time. Yeah. <laughs> that's the big one with him. But, you know, I respected it because you always knew where he stood. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's you know, for a superstar to be that authentic in our game, which there's so much money to be made. Yeah. Just smiling and fucking doing this all the time mm-hmm. and being, like, perfectly packaged. Yeah. And, yes, I've won community service awards. I've won, you know, I've, I've, I got, like, a very prestigious, like, community service kind of award. Yes, in the NFL, you did. But, but I also think you can fucking be yourself and say fuck and have fun. Yeah. And, you know, you know, be irreverent. And, like, I think somebody like Marshawn, who stands to make so much money, like, kind of risked that but still made it anyways, which yeah. I think is so cool. He's doing, like, the biggest commercials, and he never played by anybody else's rules. He did. Uh, it, it is very cool to see somebody who didn't do what the PR department would tell you to do yeah. thrive. Yeah. Yeah. He like. makes him nervous, but eventually he makes some money. Yeah, exactly. Um, I have to ask you just because, it, you know, if, in of the modern era of, of football, we really, I don't even think we can compare any franchise of the last, you know, the last 20 years were essentially dominated by New England right. and you played there right. and you got to experience a hell of a season. Yeah. I mean, do you look back? I mean, obviously you're fond of winning, uh, yeah. but do you look back and go like, that was a cool experience to play in that franchise? It, it was, I'm going to give you the, the, cause everybody, when they hear this question or hear somebody about to answer this, they're like, is it fun there? Like, because my teammate Lane Johnson famously said, you know, I would rather play here in Philly than be up there. I'm having fun here. And then the whole tag after they kept winning Super Bowls and we fell off as the Eagles was the fans would tweet at Lane and be like, having fun? You still having yeah, fun? Still having fun. Yeah. And there's something to that. Like, listen, like they have a different way of doing things. You know, they pride themselves on being more like stoic and more like even keeled. Like, and the culture has been built that way. So if a player points that out, it's not a slight. They just they're more business oriented, but they when you talk about like misconceptions about New England, there are some awesome fun guys playing for that team, and so you can be like it's draconian, it's all this bullshit, it's Bills, you know, ruling with an iron fist. Nobody has fun. The guys make it fun. So yeah. I don't care how hard you can make that place, like teammates like Julian Edelman or Danny or, you know, Rob Ninkovich or Matthew Slater, Dante Hightower, the list goes on. Like some of my favorite teammates of all time were there. So that's why I look back at that place, not just the Super Bowl and how hard it was to win it. Yeah. And how like you go from my career as a failure. We're about to lose the fucking Falcons who I almost picked in free agency. What an idiot I am at halftime mm-hmm. to we just completed the most magical come comeback of all time. And I was part of a small part of, brady's legacy sure 
you yeah, know, like no, being on sure. that team, you have like a tiny little piece. You know how they go to the fucking, you can get a piece of the bleachers yeah. when they blow a place up. Yeah. I get a little piece of the bleachers, man. You definitely do. And that's cool. You so. definitely do. I mean, yeah, without a doubt you do. I mean, yeah. also the fact, I mean, I'm sure you know the statistic, but like everybody that's, you know, wins an, a Super Bowl just goes, you know, it, there's just no feeling like being a champion, right? Like the euphoria yeah. of winning that. But to have won a Super Bowl and then you, like you have to go somewhere else and win another Super Bowl, that has to feel like you've got the the secret code. I mean, it's got to yeah. feel magical to switch teams and do it again. Yeah, I don't feel this horseshoe up my ass, man. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, like, did I? So it's just like it was crazy. I I don't believe in karma necessarily because too many guys in the league had the same eight year type stretches that I did like good players, bad teams yeah, and kind of wait, never saw the other side, like never saw the pot of gold or whatever. I got to see it. That doesn't make karma real. A lot of people were like, it's good karma. You know, one of the good guys that played a long time and was a good player is now finally winning. Like, cause we yeah. were really bad, never made the playoffs. Most games we ever won was seven, went one and 15, one and 15, two and 14, you know, winning on a Sunday was a form was, it was just an afterthought. You just showed up and survived a little bit and legitimately tested my mental health being there. I mean, I like, I bet. Um, and some people are like, you're rich, shut up. You guys don't understand what mental health is. Then if yeah. you're listening and you're saying that, but like, I, uh, I end up in new England and that was a relief, right? Sure. Because it validated my career to me, but I also wasn't like, the biggest part, you know, I, I played hundreds of snaps, six, 700 snaps, but like, you know, in Super Bowl, I played 20 plays. I was a, a role player. Uh -huh. And so I wanted to go out and finish my career, like on a high note and, and be the player I was earlier. So he took a stab at Philly, who's bottom four in the league, get picked to be, you know, bottom feeders. And I just liked the, the speed with which their defense played. And to get lucky there again, the one was like, you join a machine, you're trying to be a part of like, you get a stadium seat, right? In Philly, you get a fucking luxury suite. You yeah. know, you're a part of history there. Amazing. Amazing. And, and dudes, you know, meeting you and being like, hey, I've been a fan for, I've waited 60 years for this. And they're crying and they tell me, thank you. I'm like, dude, thank you, bro. Like, you're the reason this is so special. It's not the players. It's the, the bonding of this city and everybody has waited for it. And this very special, unique team. Yeah, that was one of those seasons where I think even somebody who goes, you know, I enjoy the game of football. Uh, there's teams you like, there's teams you don't care for. As somebody that had kind of like, I had like an indifferent stance on like Philly. I mean, I'm not from there. You know, you just, you obviously respect the organization. It was a fun thing to watch as a fan. It's fun to watch this, the a city where, you know, you haven't seen a title go to in a while, you know, or um, yeah, to, to see them win one. I, I enjoyed it. It was fun to watch. Would you be happy for Cleveland? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Cincinnati. Fuck Cleveland. Yeah, I know. That's yeah, why I do yeah, that. So, yeah. I was, but no, it was cool because you know, um, like I said, the Cinderella story, and then on top of the Cinderella story, our MVP fucking quarterback gets fucking hurt, and so you think we're dead. It's yeah, everybody. And then we like, come back the next week, and we almost we almost got run out of the gym by the Giants the next week. So we were like, damn, we really got to get together. Nick Foles then scored like ten points against Oakland to okay. like to clinch home field. Finally, I get to ask you this: you How big is his dick? dick? Is it, how is it? It's, the thing's big, dude. I, I don't know. I mean, fucking, I don't have a protractor down there. And I mean, the, you did know, you like, put yours next to him and go, oh, you got me here, but I got bigger balls? No, okay. dude. Right, no, I don't know. dude. You I know, don't like, know how locker rooms work. No, I mean, listen, there's a lot of Nick Foles dick talk. Yeah. Okay? It's 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 folklore. And, you know, like. What's the biggest dick you saw in the, in your career? I I don't like to just. I don't like. Just to, describe here's it. The don't thing. give out his you name. You know, it's I in a locker room, it's eyes up, bro. Yeah. It's eyes up because you don't want to be dis disrespectful. You could just be zoning out thinking about something. It's like, oh, God, fuck, dude. Like, I was thinking about, you know, my fantasy basketball team. Yeah. And yeah. you weren't supposed to walk across yeah. like that. But did you ever but, go, like, hey, with all due respect, you got a real nice piece on you, man? To like somebody like Nah, oh. dude. Okay. Nah, <laughs> I, 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 I don't. But, but the thing about Nick is. <laughs> He's the best guy in the world, and he's so, like, you know how, like, there's Christians that are, like, kind of, like, you know, whether you're into religion or not, you're just, like, that guy's not a real guy. Yeah. yeah. Nick Foles is a real guy. Like, he's a saint. He's, like, a... But he also is a, is a fucking legend. He's yeah. 10 feet tall. So... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's when when some... If, I, if the periphery 
if I get caught, like if something gets caught in the periphery, for it to get caught in the periphery, it has to be pretty. Okay, is I don't he know, one of those guys that like you know how like in your locker you might have like a like a footstool that kind of like folds out like a seat. He has an extra one. If you're he saying. no, if he has his leg up and and he's like he's his his legs up. Can you see his dick? hanging from below his thigh you know what i mean like if his right leg's up and you're standing well to the listen right. i this is probably the last thing i'm gonna say about it because <laughs> at some point i know okay. somebody's gonna be like hey man you were talking about nick Foles' dick a lot on the pod yeah and not know that i was asked you know how they quote you oh yeah i'll be on bleacher report they'll be like, be like chris like, was just like, talking about nick's dick on the pot chris been okay, a long tom, time <laughs> tom asked me and you asked me about the bench yes it's not hanging it's resting on the ground it's resting <laughs> okay, that's a big dick Make it known. Chris Long said Nick's got crazy <laughs> cock on him. Um, thank you for, con for confirming that story. Uh, I want to ask you this, and I know you've been asked about this before. I, n I haven't seen the question asked or heard your answer, which is why I'm excited to ask it, because I think it is incredible that you signed a, a deal and you famously donated your salary. Yeah. Right, for the but do you, like, do you just appreciate how special that is as an example like everybody's whole thing is let me accumulate as much as i can like that's how yeah. most people's you know that's most people's just drive is like it doesn't matter what i've gotten so far here's what's on the table well i'm gonna take everything given to me you know right and and you made a choice to go like i'm i'm not i don't even like how did you arrive at the decision to do that and also were people advising against that? Like your accountants or your, you know what I mean? No, like, I mean, my accountant knows that I'm just so my own, like anybody who, who lives with and around me knows I'm my own guy. Yeah. So I'm going to do what I want to do, which can be kind of dangerous. But at the same time, I want to do, I act on stupid ideas and sometimes good ones. Yeah. And, you know, I think the number one thing I want to say off the top is, yeah, I, do, I donated my salary, but I had made, a good I know a of lot money, of money, or, before, you know, yeah, like, sure. and, and so I never, one of the things that it, it actually was a stressful deal. Cause you're just like, nobody wants to be like, look at me, charity guy. Mm -hmm. And I certainly don't. And I certainly didn't for many years. Um, like I denied it like straight up because we would be doing a lot of philanthropic work, but we do it quietly and we do it in St. Louis and we do it in Charlottesville and my wife and I, Meg, who we always like to be involved in stuff like that. Um, we just didn't want to be that couple or that I didn't want to be that guy. And at a point I was like, okay, Chris, your concern about what other fucking people think about you is going to leave a lot of money that we could raise for good causes on the table. You're sitting here with this great resource that so few people in the world have. And if you don't interface with them and give them a task, you're not going you're, you're literally doing the people that you profess to be helping a disservice. So you have to lean on fans. And so I launched a foundation um you know we started water boys um and a few years into that like we 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 started accentuating some of the things we were doing in the education space because people are always like what are you doing here and i'm like well our education work here is our water work abroad and we balance that out and as that was kind of happening charlottesville for good reason got a big dump put on it i mean like because most people that have never been here or haven't heard of it and know it's a college town or that type of thing turn on the tv and there were a bunch of dudes in like tiki torches and hoods and like these fucking assholes out yeah. here and everybody's like oh, that's charlottesville and charlottesville has its problems it's an old city in the south okay there are things structurally that are very wrong here um but we we weren't that and we need to be better but we weren't that and i was at the time looking for a little bit of meaning playing football i was kind of like not feeling it anymore when i got to philly they had me on the fucking rookie field the first couple of days of practice. And I'm like, God damn, I got more sacks than anybody in this fucking building. This is what the league is going to be like now from now on for me. I'm a vet officially. So I just wasn't feeling it. And I decided, hey, I want to give this this year like some accountability for me. And I'm not making what I used to. This money, fuck it. I mean, like, I'm lucky to say fuck it. But but I want to help and do something with this year rather than just like make another you know, one five or something. Dude, that's a, that's and, and, amazing though, man. And, Honestly. But the way, the way it actually was worthwhile to publicize it was to give the fans a task and they actually match my contribution, which thank God, because otherwise I'm just doing it to say, look at me. Right. You know what I mean? And that's the importance of fans. Sure. So they met, they matched your donation. So you end up raising yeah. way more money. Yes. And so 
what it also did was I got a lot of very cool messages that kind of restored my faith in humanity because I was losing it. I'm always losing it. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's just a constant like hourglass thing with me. The faith is it's just going down. But at that point, it was really hard because of our fucking idiot president. Mm -hmm. and a bunch of idiots that he could do no wrong and at a time where we needed to be united irregardless of which is not a word i don't think but irregardless i've sure. already said it yeah. of of your politics or any other bullshit that that you like we were talking human decency and we were talking about people that needed to hear that they that they could feel safe in america when everything in history has told you the opposite this is the moment you could be a fucking slime ball your whole life but this is a moment for a US president and he went out there and he took a dump. And I remember sitting in the car after practice, seeing my hometown on TV, which for me to say that that mattered more is stupid as fuck because that happens all over the country. It's happened all over the country for eons. And for me to be like, oh, I woke up now, but I can't deny that even if I was like kind of on that plane and awake to this stuff, it did put a battery in my back. And I just was like, fuck this, dude. Like, I'm going to do something positive for somebody who's from my hometown. I'm going to give myself a reason to come out and play this year. And I'm going to spread some good vibes. And I got a lot of really nice messages of people like, I'm a contractor. I donated my salary. And that's a way bigger deal yes. than me doing it. I see what and you're so saying. And so that guy's a hero. Yes. You know, like I donated to the United Way or I did that. And it made my hair stand on end. And I was like, okay, there are decent people. And yeah. so... You know, it was good for me. Yeah, you know? I get that. It, I mean, it's it's super cool that you did it. And I think it's cool that you inspired people. It's it's still inspiring. It's an awesome Thanks. story. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. And tell me about the um the water, water charity. boys. Yeah, yeah, which is uh, uh, we we just started doing uh, wells in East Africa. I went over to climb Kilimanjaro one year for like kind of just to like have a wild hair. Yeah, brought a teammate. We loved it. Uh, I had this like kind of a epiphany that like well not a dramatic one where like it's like i could sell this as an elevator pitch where there's like slow motion and nobody had water or something i just as a pragmat pragmatist i'm just like how can we best lift people up over here who gave us such a great experience man and when i met people and they're wonderful stoic beautiful brilliant people that speak multiple languages and are farmers and are businessmen and women and are you know and our children and they don't have anything good to like anything clean to drink. Like literally, you know, the countryest dude you live in Cincinnati wouldn't go swimming in places that, you know, that, you know, in Cincinnati wouldn't go swimming in places that people are getting their water from. So that, that was the visuals crazy, but it's the facts. And, you know, um, we started doing solar powered wells. We started water boys. We brought players from different teams on because you have to know your limitations you know um st louis ain't the biggest market and i'm not a superstar so we 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 had a goal of 32 wells for 32 teams they're large solar powered wells they provide water from for five to seven thousand people and we're i'm proud to say we shattered that and we've moved to a one million people serve goal we're halfway done 100 wells we're doing domestic work we're on navajo nation we're doing hometown h2o and we launched which i'm really proud of a women's initiative called water for her which we already have 15 great, um, great influencers like Julie Ertz, who's Zach Ertz is Julie Ertz's husband. Is, do you notice how I said that? Yes. Um, I like that. Eagles. Yes. Uh, because it's fucking true. Yeah. <laughs> Zach, you're, you're her, her husband. Not, uh, she's not your wife. Um, Take that, she's Zach. So, she has yeah, Zach. She's so badass. And there's just a bunch of badass women like her that, that rush to help immediately because it is a women's cause. The, 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 the burden of gathering water falls on uh, women and girls' shoulders in sub-Saharan Africa and all around the world. And, you know, th when women succeed, society succeeds. As if it wasn't right on its head, there's empirical data to suggest that if you want to pull a place out of poverty, let the women lead and not be doing, you know, tasks like that, menial, dangerous, yeah. pointless tasks. So it's, it's good work. Um, and we've had a lot of help from a lot of good dudes. That's amazing. And, and if people want to check and out girls. those, uh, organizations, is there a website to direct them? Waterboys.org. Waterboys.org. Okay. Which I'm sorry you tried. I know you tried to get that domain name and they Bro. fucking stick the door on you. You're talking to the champ right now. You Dry might have boy. Super Bowl rings. I'm fucking dripping all day, every day. Okay. Dude, look at this. You see this shit? Where's yeah. your fucking water thing? I'm Show me where, where's your water thing on the fucking table. Hold on a second. Oh, that's tight. Oh, okay. I got to oh, no. prove. 
Oh, yeah, enjoy all the fucking uh, BPAs you're getting right down your throat, Tom. Yeah, it's called Evian. I'm French, bro. Fuck, this is plastic. By the way, I was going to ask you, top, <laughs> yeah. top, top tier and bottom tier waters, go oh, real quick. I mean, your go-to has got to be Fiji. I like the silica. It's all about the minerals, bro. And then Evian's my second choice. Um, there's this uh, water from... Uh, What's it called? What is it? The uh, the Iceland one that Martin brought in. That's it's also really good. And then dog shit would be Dasani, uh, Dasani. Smart Water, and uh, that that spring one. What is the springs one we used to get here? Poland spring. Arrowhead. Arrowhead. Fuck. Oh, Arrowhead. I, I was gonna ask you where that went because I thought maybe you had your fingers fingers on the pu pulse. Thankfully, I haven't seen that in a while. Dis You're disrespecting Aquapana. Oh, Aquapana is good. You're right. When Aqu you're at a rich people place, when they pour it, I almost feel guilty. Yes, Aquapan is tight. Dasani is just like, hey, here's a hose connected to someone's house. To it's just a, a backyard. Bag. Yeah, it's a trash bag water. I mean, the funny thing about, I didn't even notice about smart water is that, and people generally don't notice that when they go, and it's, uh, it's like, I forget the word when they're like, it's stripped down, like triple, triple stripped down of all. So my friend Martin Risa, who's a water sommelier, explained to me, that you know how you, you drink waters, like especially like these brands, and they taste different. You're like, oh, that right. actually, you don't really know how to explain it. How come it tastes different from the water fountain? He's like, it's all about mineral content. And when somebody like a brand like Smart Water, they go, well, the thing is, we have, uh, we have done the remove the minerals three times. He goes, so any like properties that that water had are completely gone. So that's why taste wise, it, it should basically taste like absolutely nothing. Like there's that silky taste in Fiji. And that's that mineral silica. That's why it, it tastes yeah. like there's silk in your mouth, yeah. you know? But yeah. The, I, like, I like some silt. Yeah. I like some, I want all the stuff that they, you know, when you're mining for gold. Dude, that you get. That's a, I want to chew rocks when I'm drinking water. You know what I mean? That's I how wanna, pure I am. I'm, yeah, I drink, I drink ocean water. I don't give a fuck. I, oh. I eat sand. Yeah, I'm crazy, bro. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's crazy. I'm on my fourth I'm kidney. I'm intimidated. Yeah, I, totally, no. I totally take it back. You are the water king. Thank you. You heard it. He said it. Nick Foles got a huge dick. I'm the water champ. Listen to Green Light wherever podcasts are available. <laughs> uh, oh, dude, this was a lot of fun. I really, really like appreciate fun. this. We got to do a uh, home and home. You got to come on uh, our shit. I'm in. No, I'm I don't want to say it like that. Yeah, no, I'm in. And also, I'll be in Charlottesville, so I could even come in. Uh, you know, we'll do dude, that. Dude, we should do an in-person shindig if you're not too tired from your awesome show that you're going to do great at. And Thank it's you. It's going to be such a long-standing ovation. Th that, that I hopefully tired. won't bomb at. Then, yeah, that would be great. I, I'm good. in. I'm in. All right, brother. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll do it again soon. Yes, sir. Thanks, Tom.